Welcome to the Nerd Party. Ah, oh, Miles here. Owl Post for the week is freshly delivered once again, and I am just one of your hosts here, Matthew Rushing. And, of course, with me as she is every single week, the only person I would want to do this with, Drea Kaufman. Hello! Hey, how are you? I am good. How are you all? Uh, well, you know what? Uh, doing pretty well. Um, excited to be here um, because, you know, it's, I don't know, it's just been so much fun talking through uh, these Ah, it's just been so much fun, honestly, talking through these books. Uh, and, you know, we're at such a, um, just a really cool place uh, for the the series. Um, we're at one of the, I think, uh, I would say most incredible chapters. Um, it's, it's, it's just like, yeah, it's one of my favorite chapters in the entire series. In fact, I would say... This chapter and the next chapter are possibly two of my favorite chapters in the entire series. Um, maybe only, I think maybe only uh, beat by the two chapters in the very last book, um, which I can't really talk about because it would spoil things. Um, but before we dive into this chapter, just want to thank you so much for listening. Uh, you can find us wherever you get your podcasts. Um, we're on Apple Podcasts, but we're all over the place. So if you're not an Apple listener, you can find us there. Now, if you are somebody who happens to use iTunes or um, Apple Podcasts, please give us a star rating review. Let people know what they think of the show. Uh, it's still one of the main places where people find uh, the podcast. Uh, podcasts so we really could use your help there uh and uh you can follow us all over the place at join nerd party uh we're on facebook at facebook.com slash the nerd party or the nerd and then uh, maybe you'd like to send an email with your thoughts or questions to dre and i and you can do that over at the nerd slash contact choose a show choose our post and then that email comes to dre and i so uh well drea series died last chapter he died. Yeah. I tell you, he did. Yeah. And uh, watching Harry deal with the ramifications here for a moment of his death, fighting against Lupin, saying, no, he's not dead. He is just, I mean, the beginning of this chapter is, is just heartbreaking in this moment. I've heard, I've heard voices from behind the curtain. You don't understand. He, he wants me to come help him. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, the way he sort of rationalizes his way through it is, is I think, the most heartbreaking part of it. And that, like, he looked at everything that Sirius has done for him and why he's all done it. And it's all to help Harry. And he knows Harry's in trouble right now. And if, you know, if he could be there and come back, he would be there and come back, which tells Harry he can't. He can't. And Harry never says it to himself he never says that means he's dead he says it means he can't come back and Mm -hmm. it's it's hard like there's a little bit of acceptance Mm -hmm. there but for the most part i think this is sort of that first step in the denial process the grieving you know the grieving process here where he's sort of rationalizing what happened um and is kind of immediately followed up with neville asking you know was was this guy a friend and, you know, you kind of are brought back into the story with that and reminded that Neville hasn't really been a part of the inner group so far and doesn't know about Sirius and Harry's relationship with him. And he's sort of just trusting that he was there for the right reasons, you know. Um, and it, it brings you kind of right back to everything that's happening. Um, but that whole first couple of pages or page and a half, is just, it's hard to read. It's so hard to know that Harry's going to have to process yet another dead family member. It, and it's, it really is a big moment here because, you know, we, we saw Sirius in the last chapter fall into the veil and disappear. And we've heard voices beyond the veil 
So I think the thing that is so fascinating about this is that, you know, we, we've had ghosts in the story, obviously. But this seems to be Rowling really saying in her Harry Potter universe, there is some sort of something beyond death. And so that there is there is a beyond and uh, it's it's subtle, but it's there. And I think it's fascinating because the, the whole idea of death is also going to play into the rest of this chapter too. Um, the conversation we're about to have between Voldemort and Dumbledore is going to touch on this very subject. And so I think her having Sirius die and fall into the veil and vanish is a moment that accentuates what Dumbledore is about to say in this well, chapter. I didn't really read into it. I was like, there's... There's more after death. I just run into it in the sense of that death is not necessarily as straightforward as we all think it is and how a lot of movies portray it as, right? You're alive and then you're dead and that's it, right? Like once you're dead, that's where your your presence stops. That's where the thought process stops. Like that's, it's literally where your exist, like where your impact ends, right? Is what most of the time you think of death. And I think it just paints the picture of there's, it's so much more complicated than that. And the process of grieving and the process of, of what your legacy does to others and to the world is so much more complicated than the straightforward you're alive or you're dead. And I think that that is a big part is kind of how I took it. So less about what comes after death, but more about what comes after death for everybody else and not necessarily for the, the person who died. Um, and I, I think both theories hold up and she kind of plays with both, but I definitely went more just down the, how is this, how does this, like, what does this mean? How, how does death manifest itself in different ways? Um, and, and, you know, and we'll get we'll get to the kind of some of the rest of what you're talking about with with uh, Voldemort and Dumbledore, but um, yeah, I just think this is that big theme she plays with. She plays with death throughout kind of all the books, and what does that mean, and what does that look like, and what what does that actually what is it? And um, I think that this is kind of that big picture question being asked, and Harry sort of having to rationalize his way through it, while um, I I almost played in my head in the rest of the scene where he's kind of running out the door um escaping at this point which is also very different from the book um Voldemort Dumbledore doesn't show up here in the movie he shows up in the foyer which we'll get to eventually but he's you know Dumbledore's with them um so they run out and they're escaping and the whole time he's running it says things like you know he's kind of dodging spells but it's very sort of flippant how they handle his escape from the rest of the battle and i just kind of play it was one of those things where i'm hearing nothing it's that moment in a movie where you're hearing silence and all of this madness is happening around it but everything is kind of like deadly silent right now that was for me that that rest of this scene where he's leaving the battle with the rest of the death eaters that's what i'm hearing i was like hearing nothing it was like all in harry's head just harry thinking to himself and getting out of the room and that when he finally bursts through the door and runs into, you know, Ron and Ginny and, and the rest of them out there, that's when I'm like, okay, now the noise kicks back in and the thought, you know, he's kind of snapped back to reality. Uh, but in my own mind, it was so, he was kind of petrified almost emotionally that I'm just, I'm not hearing anything. Um, Maybe I added too, I've been watching too many movies and I added too many th thematical elements to my reading process, but um, I just felt like it was a, it was a heavy, a heavy moment um, where he almost didn't care anymore whether he lived or died. Yeah, no, I think that's very true because I think that Harry has that moment where he, he absolutely, I don't think, um, carries a, cares about his own life at this moment um, because, you know, his his godfather just died. Yeah, I I think too. Um, just quickly before we completely move on, uh, the the whole point, the whole part of of death here, 
is something we'll talk about this chapter, we'll talk about it in the next chapter, and it is something that will um, play a huge part in the last book. Her it I- essentially consumes the entire yeah, last yeah, book. Like exactly. That's the whole last book. <laughs> At uh, least the last yep. half of the last yes, book. Yeah. Yes. Um, so she's really just, I think, she's completely setting the stage in this, in, in this last part of this book in somewhat uh, in the Half-Blood Prince and then all the way through the end of the Deathly Hallows. The, the idea that the, this, this story, the Harry Potter story, is all about death and how we respond to it um, is truly going to be w- what we play out. So it's just, it's fascinating here. I do kind of love Harry running after Bellatrix and just being so consumed with the idea of uh, that, you know, he wants revenge at this point. He wants her to die. And he uses the Cruciatus curse on her, which stops her, but she mocks him because she says, You've never used an unforgivable curse before, uh, and you have to really mean it. And I think what's really interesting here is that Harry's righteous anger against her for killing his, you know, godfather is not enough. Uh, Yeah, she even says that. She says, you know, your righteous anger is not going to cause me pain the way you want it to. Um, she specifically calls out the fact that why he's angry isn't a good enough reason when using something like an unforgivable curse. Which, interestingly enough, if we go back in time a little bit, if we remember the last time, or I guess kind of the first time we were really introduced to these unforgivable curses was in Defense Against the Dark Arts, right? And it was um, Barty Crouch Jr. impersonating Mad-Eye Moody. And it was interesting because he was able to pull off those curses in that classroom against those spiders, like, flawlessly. Like, there was not, the, it, it was just like it was an easy curse to do. And now knowing that you need to have this sort of raw anger and hatred behind yourself to even execute these curses, like... That, thinking back to that classroom, makes that whole scene that made everyone uncomfortable that much more sort of terrifying. That this impersonator, knowing now it's a Death Eater, was able to just sort of nilly-willy do those curses with the amount of pent-up anger that is within him is kind of terrifying when you think about it and you think back to the ability to do that. Um, And it's one of those moments where it sort of ties and is another way that we really should have known that that wasn't Mad-Eye, but we would have had no idea at the time. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, And I I love here, too, that Harry has a way to taunt Bellatrix that she doesn't even know yet, which is saying, the prophecy is gone. And what you came here to do, you failed to do. And he knows. And... She doesn't mm-hmm. realize that. She thinks he's lying. She's She calls for the prophecy. You know, she's trying to accio the prophecy and it's not working. Um, and Harry just kind of continues to taunt her. And he's like, there's nothing left to summons. And Harry, she, you know, she, she stops saying like, you know, master, I tried, I tried. And he says that, you know, Oh, don't waste your breath. He can't hear you. And then the moment where everything changes, a high, cold, crisp voice says, can't I? I do love, though, that the way we know, like, so Harry, you, you think, okay, Harry's lying that, you know, the master's angry or he knows that I'm not lying, is when he says that his scar just starts mm-hmm. burning so furiously. Um, and it just confirms that like, yeah, in fact, he does know because we, he's, he's sort of already told us throughout this book that whenever something happy happens to Voldemort, he feels that joy. And whenever something angers him, he feels that anger all in that scar, right? So the fact that he says he knows and then instantly sort of has this burning feeling in his head and this sharp pain, it confirms to us as readers that, yeah, Harry is not lying to Velatrix in this moment, not about breaking it, but about him not being happy with her. He knows that, truthfully he is pissed off. Well, and I do love that, you know, uh, as Bellatrix is, is, you know, 
groveling at his feet trying to, you know, <laughs> say she's sorry and everything. He's like, months of preparation and my Death Eaters have been thwarted by Harry Potter again. He's like, I will deal with you later. And he turns his attention to Harry. And before anything else happens, um, he launches the the Avada Kedavra curse at Harry and the fountain that Harry has been hiding behind comes alive and saves Harry's life. Uh, traps the fountain also traps Bellatrix so she can't move uh, and Dumbledore has arrived and how much cooler would this have been in the movie? Oh, so much cooler. It really so is so much, much cooler. cooler. Yeah. Um, oh, MG. I had completely forgotten about the scene. And when I was reading mm-hmm. it, I was like, this is so much more dramatic and so much more magical than this sort of fire and water fight we get mm-hmm. in the movie. And yeah. like, A+. Plus. Yep. And some of the stuff that they do in the movie actually happens in the book. But the whole idea of bringing the fountain to life is the thing that's just so beautiful. I mean, the, the, the fact that Dumbledore uses this to partition everybody off the playing field. So Harry's caught, uh, Bellatrix is caught, so now it's just him and uh, Voldemort. And the, the best part about this whole thing is that the way she describes... Dumbledore in all of this how he's just like so calm cool and collected he's talking as if they're they're having basically a drink together you know how you know you shouldn't have come here Tom you know it it was a mistake you know and how this is the moment where they have the conversation of oh you don't seek to kill me you're above such brutality and and that he's like, oh, there are other ways of destroying a man, Tom, you know, and merely taking your life would, would not satisfy me, I must admit. And how Voldemort says then, you know, there is nothing worse than death. And Dumbledore says, uh, that's where you're quite wrong. There are things much worse than death. And it's your failure to understand this that has uh, been your greatest weakness. And it's like, such a powerful conversation we're having, but more so than the movie, in all of this, Dumbledore, there's never a point in this fight where Dumbledore can't handle what's being thrown at him. Like, there's never a moment where he looks weak or anything like that, which I hate that the movie does. Um, well, there is one moment near the end of the battle um, where it sort of catches him off guard a little bit, where I think... Voldemort gets a spell through and I think one of the living statues jumps in and deflects it or something. Well, no, it's um, the moment where Fox has to come in and eats the where spell. Fox has yeah. to come in, yeah. right, and take, it's the snake, he, he turns the mm-hmm. fire into a snake and then it starts to, there's a moment where he's, a, where Dumbledore's a little bit vulnerable in the battle. Um, so it's not entirely like Dumbledore kicked his royal tush, but it's also to the point where, like, because Dumbledore has so many allies and has built such strong relationships, you have a character like Fox swoop in and self-sacrifice in order to save Dumbledore. Um, that it happens. But, you know, it, I agree in that he never really seems weak. Because even in that moment, you're not depicted this Dumbledore, like, frightened by what's about to happen to him or fearful for his life or anything like that, right? We never get that side in. There's definitely, it seems more like Dumbledore's at the disadvantage instead of the advantage um, in the movie. So I, I agree with that a lot, that this we end up with this much more total bad boy Dumbledore like he is just one bad M effer in this chapter and so powerful and it finally really shows you why he's earned all these orders why everyone holds him in such high regard it really he's really sort of earning his his legacy here all of the room all he's earned his chocolate frog card right like there's a reason for it here um and, and it is quite quite remarkable this battle that happens and how powerful we really learned Dumbledore to be yeah, I think 
th- this chapter just does such a better job of this fight too. And and a lot of things we see that happened in the movie, you know, where the spells they're throwing at each other are interesting. I mean, you get moments too where, um, you know, instead of that kind of weird flying apparition type thing for, you know, um, they'll just appear and disappear, you know, like, uh, so they, they've, the, the apparition is just uh, instantaneous for them to, to do that with each other. Um, the spells they're throwing at each other are just incredible. Um, some of them again are similar to the movie. Um, but the, the, the conversation that they have here I think is the thing that's really becomes the key because it's the thing that will carry on into the rest of the series about how Dumbledore is saying there is there is so much worse than death um and it's your lack of understanding on that that's your greatest weakness and how you can really see that that Voldemort's Achilles heel is the thought that he might die is this fear of not living mm-hmm. anymore, which will really, like we mentioned, really, really become apparent at really the end of the next book. Really, there's kind of a crucial moment at the in the next book that we really truly understand what what that is um, and how how to what measures Dumbledore mm-hmm. or what measures Voldemort actually has right. this fear. Like what what ex- what lengths is he willing to go to? Um, which is interesting when we're talking about that, because one scene here that's similar to the movie, but a little bit different, just based on the fact that I think you have different vehicles and abilities to do things in books that you don't in movies, is the fact that we have the scene where Voldemort sort of possesses Harry, right? Which happens in the movie, but it seems very much so like he is being controlled by Voldemort. In this case, in the book, it's much more just like he has gone into his mind and now they are both there, right? Like there, there's these two thought processes happening. And basically what has happening is Voldemort is just torturing Harry. Um, and it basically says, Dumbledore, if life is, you know, if there's not, if there's, if death is no big deal, you should kill this boy because, you know, I'm torturing him and that's worse than death, right? Um, and Harry sort of is like, yeah. This is that moment where he's like, you know what? Kill me. This hurts. I get to see, I get to see uh, Sirius again and my parents. If you kill me, you know, just, just do it. Just do it. All of this will be over if you just do it. And I think not only does that speak to death and then sort of the theme we've been talking about there, but it speaks to one of those themes that we've been dabbling in this whole series um, with depression, because that same thought process is very apparent in people who are suicidal, right? The pain of what they're experiencing in that moment is so great that they would much rather die so they don't have to experience it anymore. So they don't have to and you think about Harry always worrying about hurting the people around him by his actions and his very existence and people willing to sacrifice themselves for him. This is, He's gone to a very dark place here where he's just like, I'm in pain. This is too much for me to handle. And I want I want to be with those I love. Um, and he basically kind of in his mind, obviously, just gives up. And that's sort of the first time we've sort of seen Harry just straight up give up. Um, and it it just really resonates for you and and it, it's hard to hear and hard to process in that moment for anyone who's been through something or felt or 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 had that thought process happen to themselves and it's it's a big deep moment that doesn't have that same impact in the movie because it's much you're kind of more like you get that fearful Dumbledore not realizing that Voldemort could get in Harry's head and talk through Harry right it's a very different way it's it's portrayed in the movie than it is in the book and it's just so it's a small moment in this big battle but man does it have a big kind of a big impact in it I think the fact that Dumbledore is never phased throughout the fight um, that all of this has been almost for him as easy as them having a conversation over a butter beer uh, is the thing that makes it so much more impactful when he's, you know, it looks like he's trapped uh, Voldemort in the water and everything goes away. Voldemort seems to have been to be gone. Uh, and then. He tells Harry, he says, stay where you are. And for the first time, Dumbledore sounds frightened. 
It's the only time in the series so far, I feel like, that we've ever had a sense of fear from Vol- from Dumbledore. And then it becomes this moment about Harry being possessed by Voldemort. And I, re- I read this slightly differently in the sense I don't, I don't see this as a moment of depression for Harry. I see this more as a moment of resignation for Harry. And for him, I think this is what makes what I was saying um, before about the idea of death. In the last chapter, Harry has a completely different idea of death, which is it's not an end for him. He will see his family again. There is something so powerful about that because it's it's that he will see his his family and he will see Sirius again and there's this whole sense of like empowering love that Voldemort cannot take and he leaves and um they play that up in the movie that it's like this idea of love love. but it's much more powerful because they don't connect it with um, the love he has for for his friends, they connect it with the love he has for those that are that are already gone. It's it's serious the moment that he would get to see serious, and so I think there's a real power in that because again, it is a completely different view of death. Voldemort has this idea that death is the end; that there is nothing after death. Harry doesn't have that belief. Um. He believes that he will see his those that were lost already again. And so um, that view of death separates them by multitudes. And so I think it's a really powerful part of the story. Um, and obviously it it is that love for which Voldemort has no understanding of, you know, because Voldemort doesn't care about anybody other than himself. I can see what you're saying. I think there is a moment for him along with the resignation. I think I think he goes through both sort of a, I don't want to say fear because he's not really afraid of what's happening to him. There goes to this moment of the pain is too great to bear, just end it. And then, which, uh, so I sort of think of it, I sort of think of it as like a cycle, right? Like the pain is so great, he wants the pain to end and he just wants to die, Right. In this, like, sort of resignation standpoint, right? Because they they actually do in that point. He says, like, this is so painful. It's causing a lot of pain. And then I think he comes around full circle to what you're talking about. And he accepts the fact, he sort of accepts the fact that he's dying and that that's not the worst thing in the world, right? So he sort of kind of goes over, for me, a roller coaster where he goes through sort of the depression, just kill me now type feeling. And then what I think, I think you're absolutely right. I think that that, that acceptance and that, that empowerment, like you put it, um, of the fact that this is not the worst thing that could happen to him. It's that sort of feeling that really casts Voldemort away. And I think makes it not rewarding for him anymore, right? He can keep torturing Harry, but at some point Harry's like, well, you can keep torturing me. If I die, I die, you know, like, what are you going to do? Um, and I think that, I think I agree. That's the moment that sort of casts him from Harry because that's something that Voldemort can't really handle or process. That's the torturing of him back, right? Inadvertently. And so it, it's really quite fascinating how that, that whole, little thought process plays out Um, because when he wakes um, you realize things have been happening outside of Harry while he's been fighting sort of this internal struggle. Yeah. I I think, and I love the beauty of the, the way that she describes it is that she says as heart, Harry's heart fills with emotion, the creature's coils loosened and the pain was gone. And you get this sense again, like Voldemort and love don't mix. Because what Harry is feeling in that moment that he will see Sirius again um, is love, you know. And so I think there's there's such a beauty in the way that she tells the story because love has always been something that, again, Voldemort has no understanding of. And so, and then... Well, and it's because part of that's the opposite of fear, which is 
essentially every single one of Voldemort's actions thus far and, and it are started sort of confirmed here in his um his his little uh, coffee talk with Dumbledore that um you know everything Voldemort has pretty much ever done has been out of fear right the whole reason he is he took up arms and raised an army against people was because he was fearful of being treated differently as a wizard so I mean, there's just so much fear and there's just so much everything we know of him has been done um, for fear of losing power, for fear of all of these things. And so I think that that's just the resonating theme here is that fear and love aren't compatible. Yeah, I I 100 percent agree, Um, you know, and I love the moment, too, because, you know, as as Harry kind of comes to um, is uh, the atrium starts filling with people and you know we've got you know fudge there and um they realize dumbledore's there and fudge immediately says arrest he uh, he, he acknowledges that voldemort was there right but then he immediately right. see mo- the moment he sees dumbledore he immediately is like arrest him and then i just love dumbledore except he doesn't actually say it which which is different from the you know uh, this whole scene is uh, absolutely mm-hmm. completely different from the movie. Like the movie and the scene are not alike at all. Um, one the the movie has Voldemort and Bellatrix sort of like running off in fear at, as people show up, um, and Cornelius Fudge like like awestruck. And in this moment in the book, he's just flabbergasted. He just doesn't know what to say or what to do. And and there is a scene um, where it says that. Dumbledore can see Cornelius Fudge very strongly feeling like he should tell someone to arrest Dumbledore, but he doesn't like, you could still see that that's his impulse. Um, And I think Dumbledore calls him out on it. Like, I know you really want to arrest me, but you've seen it for yourself now. So you can tell that I haven't been lying to you, which should sort of undo everything you thought I did. And let's move on. And then Dumbledore gets straight to the point, which I love. He's so efficient. <laughs> yeah, I, I think what I love is that he just begins to dictate what's going to happen. Like Dumbledore has has kind of been playing nice with everybody throughout this. Yeah. This, you know, he's been waiting for this kind of moment to happen where everybody realizes he hasn't been lying, and this is the point where he says, uh, "You're going to remove Dolores." Umbridge from Hogwarts. Uh, you're going to have the Order stop chasing my care of magical creatures, teacher. Uh, and uh, then I'm going to give you 30 minutes, which I think will be quite enough to explain all the ramifications of what have just happened here. And then I'm going back to my school. And if you need my help, you can address me at Hogwarts as headmaster with whatever you need. Um, and he creates a port key and sends Harry back to Hogwarts telling him I will be back in 30 minutes uh, and we will talk about everything that's happened. And Harry feels that kind of sensation of, of you know, leaving the atrium. But I just love the way that, that Dumbledore handles all of this. It's just fantastic. It, it is. It's, it's one of my, I think my favorite part about Dumbledore is he is so matter of fact straight to the point he sort of gives orders but they're not always orders right he gives orders in in a way that they aren't presented as orders right he didn't say cornelius you're gonna make me headmaster of hogwarts again he just said i'm going back to the school and if you want to find me you can address a letter to the headmaster and it'll find its way to me um he just has this very matter of fact way of telling people what's going to happen without telling without giving them orders and i i just it speaks to my very soul. Like, there's a part of that that I'm like, I want to learn your ways, Dumbledore. Te- teach me your great. ways. It's pretty great. So uh, I think uh, I just really, I love this chapter, though. I love um, what it does for the character of Dumbledore, honestly. I, I think it's one that really brings him alive um, and makes him... This is the moment where you just realize, and I love the fact that the chapter, she literally just says it. It's the only one he ever feared. The only one that Tom Riddle has ever been afraid of is Dumbledore. Um, And it's really fantastic. Uh, And I think the way that it's played here is, is just done much better in the movie to actually portray that, that 
Voldemort is is afraid of Dumbledore. So, and I think it's fantastic. And we do arise with a question from this chapter, which won't be answered until the last book, but Dumbledore does say, I, uh, that, uh, that killing you would not satisfy me. Why? If Dumbledore is truly able to take on Voldemort, why doesn't he just end it all now? Which is a question that we won't get answered for a while. Uh, actually, it's an, it's a question we won't get answered until the next chapter as to why Dumbledore can't just do that. It's interesting because I think the character of Dumbledore is almost a passive character in most of the books. He has a lot of knowledge. He imparts a lot of that in terms of forwarding the plot. But we don't actually see him do much, right? And this is sort of the first book where he actually does stuff, right? He fends off all the guards and snaps himself away from Hogwarts. And then we have this sort of epic portrayal of his skills in this final battle. And I think that's probably my favorite part of his role in this book is that we finally get sort of the, he's, he's now walking the talk um, and, and we get to take him from sort of a passive informational character to actually an active fighting participant and and you never believe he's not that um but you definitely get it shown to you and you have there can be no doubt in your mind that he's earned those titles um here and i think i just love that transition from him being sort of by the side puppet master to actually in the battle and fighting the fight as well which we hadn't seen before yeah i mean it's it's i think the thing about it is just really powerful uh, and so I agree. I just and 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 I think it's it's really neat to see just how powerful Dumbledore is, and it 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 creates a real sense of 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 um, desire to to have some of this stuff explained. And like Harry, you know, we're left wanting that explanation now because we'll be waiting for it till the next chapter. Um, and Drea, well, be- and I th- and I think that. Um, before before we wrap up here, I also think that they also, it also, if you think about, we talked a little bit about in the last chapter how this battle felt real for the kids and right there was there this real peril that we put the characters in. Thinking about that, that means Voldemort was either always there or always planned on arriving at the ministry. And that adds a whole new level of terror to what was happening and the severity of the fact that Dumbledore needed to not only show up, but actually engage in the battle tells you and tells Harry the real nitty gritty, deep, dark severity of that whole night and how actually big whatever just happened is because the two big players showed up to duke it out. And that's not something you do for no good reason. And that's something that just makes that whole last chapter that much more terrifying. Because even for whatever reason, had the kids made it through the Death Eaters, we, they'd have to make it through Voldemort too. And that, I don't know. That's one of those things where you're like, oh, wow. They almost had to do that on their own. Um, and I think it just... When you think then about what happened, it adds even more weight to that whole situation that we talked about last last episode and last chapter of could have killed, they could have all died. You know, they really could have all died if Dumbledore had not been able to actually come back and had not been aware of the situation. Which we still don't know how that was, but magic. Magic. And it and it also lets you know that what they were fighting over this idea of this prophecy was something that was really important. Right. You know, if it brought Voldemort out of hiding for a world that To a place he... To to the ministry of all places, right? Right. And to a place that had, at, to this point, didn't think he was even around. I think um, it's... He risked a lot. Yeah. He, he yeah. risked a lot for this thing that we don't even really know what or why it is. And it seems so insignificant 
that that just makes this whole situation it adds more questions it adds more mystery behind all of this and really shows it was important for some reason and it adds to more of that question you were just talking about you know why won't dumbledore just kill voldemort if he's possible and why did they want this prophecy so badly like what is it Sadly, we have to wait till the next chapter to find out an answer to a lot of these questions, which is great because oh, we it. get a lot of answers finally. Um, and in fact, I would say that the next chapter is the most pivotal chapter in the entire series because it really shifts the entire story um, mm -hmm. to, you know, you've been building and building and building and we're finally going to get a lot of answers. And so I, I'm gonna, so excited. We're going to get a lot. Of, of information on what the rest of the series is going to look like. It's really going to set the stage for what to expect for the next two books. Yep. 100%. Um, so I guess we'll uh, be there next week, but Drea, before on we, that note. <laughs> yeah, before we get there, uh, where can everybody catch up with you um, and uh, talk to you about uh, this or anything else that's going on? Sure. You can find me on Twitter at PCF Chick or on Instagram at Drea Kaufman and it's C-O-F-F-M-A-N. And then you can uh, find me on Twitter, Instagram, Letterboxd, or Vero under the name Matt Rushing 2 um, I'm here on the network doing aggressive negotiations with John Mills. Uh, we are talking about Star Wars each and every week. Uh, it's so much fun. So if you're a Star Wars fan, uh, this is the place for you. You can also find me on the Track FM network doing two shows. Uh, one is called The Orb with Chris Jones talk, talking about Star Trek Deep Space Nine. You can find me on the uh, General Geek Show, The 602 Club, where we talk about all of the fandoms we love. And then last but not least, doing the show called Cinema Stories with my good friend Courtney. And that is where we talk about films, but through the lens of faith. But we want to say thank you so much for checking your owl post. Mischief managed. Join the revolution. Join the nerd party.